uh, I'd like to keep us on schedule, so we're going to proceed. Um, our second panel today, um, we're going to discuss uh, three high-profile sentence enhancements, three strikes, gun enhancements, and hate crimes. Our panelists, and uh, you'll, uh, I'll ask you to give your five-minute opening remarks in this order, are Mike Reynolds, who's the author of the original three strikes ballot measure. Um, and I wanna, for uh, Mr. Reynolds' appearance, I wanna make special thanks to assembly member Arambula and his staff who um, donated their offices and were extremely helpful on the technical side in ensuring uh, Mr. Reynolds' appearance. Uh, Erlon Woods, who is the co-host and co-creator of the Ear Hustle podcast. Uh, Jeffrey Aaron, a public defender from Mendocino County, and Angela Chan, who's policy director and se senior staff attorney at the Asian Americans um, Advancing Justice Program. So uh, with that, uh, Mr. Reynolds, can you kick us off? All right, we're uh, kind of setting up for the first time here and trying to find some lighting that uh, uh, doesn't show me in shadow. Uh, let's... Uh, Let's kick this off a little bit. First of all, I'm not uh, an attorney, uh, lawyer, uh, professor. Uh, I'm just, you know, Joe average citizen. I, I'm a photographer. How did I get into this mess? And, uh, uh, you know, when did it all start? You know, where did it all start? Um, it started with this photo right here. And I'm going to hopefully be able to, you can see that. This was taken exactly 29 years ago on this date. It was a photo of my daughter. She was murdered 30 days, well, about 40 days after, right at the end of June, a month after this. Shot by and killed by uh, two guys fresh out of prison, repeat offenders. Um, they were easily able to acquire a 357 Magnum and uh, uh, they uh, uh, literally, uh, in the course of a purse snatching, uh, put the 357 Magnum against her head and pulled the trigger. Um, we, uh, after finding out that these guys were on the street, we said, why are they on the street? Um, you know, it seems like the very first directive of any government, elected or uh, employed or appointed, should be the protection of the people they represent. And I, that should be you know, our very first uh, uh, commandment, if you will, in terms of, of uh, uh, what uh, we should be doing. But uh, uh, quite clearly, this was uh, uh, not being observed to allow these uh, kinds of offenders back out on the streets repeatedly, time after time after time. So uh, we uh, looked at a three strikes law, uh, a three time loser law, if you want to call it that. And lo and behold, there was already one on the books, and it's still there today, I might add. And I believe it's under a PC 667.7 you uh, that are in law enforcement can refer to it quite quickly, I'm sure. Um, and it provided after a third serious or violent felony, you'd get life without parole. Uh, the only problem is, is, is uh, we were able to do a search on it and find out why it had not been working. Um, this is why it had not been working. It had only been used 42 times in a 10 year period. That's four point two times per year over 10 years. Why is that? <clears throat> well, uh, it, it simply came down to um, there was enough exemptions and, and uh, provisions in it. It was a very tough law. It's just that it didn't apply to anybody. You couldn't find anybody that would actually, in fact, qualify for it. We were also very much aware of um, uh, what you might call the, the uh, crime curve where offenders, once they get about 39 years old, uh, they seem to stop doing crime as frequently. The expression is they do it nine out of 10 times in their 20s and 30s, and in their 40s and 50s, it's one out of 10. So the question is, how do we lock these guys up or keep them uh, uh, away from society during the shortest amount of time uh, when they represent uh, the greatest amount of threat to public safety? And that was the second strike. It is talked about the least amount, but it is the most effective portion of three strikes. And it's used for, you know, like 10 times more frequently than the third strike is. What it does, as you well know, is it doubles the time. It makes them serve 80% of it. 
and it usually gets them up and to about that 48, uh, 40 age limit. And, and that usually is when they, they phase out. But when they do come out of prison, they uh, will well know that if they come back with another serious or violent felony, that it will in fact uh, be the trigger strike that uh, puts them away. And it was extraordinarily effective. Uh, effective is what the whole key is. What can we do to make laws that actually work? And that, that's where um, uh, our concern is, is uh, to be making these just for, uh, uh, to make us feel good doesn't mean a dang thing. The question is, is, is it going to make us safer? And after the passage of three strikes, we saw crime drop very quickly. Uh, my daughter was murdered in 1992. Those were the highest crime numbers in 91, 92, and 93 were the highest crime numbers uh, ever uh, recorded in California. And from there, they dropped rather quickly after three strikes. Within about a four or five year period, our, our crime rates were dropped in half. Now, what does that mean? It means that Literally, I don't care whether you like the law or not, every person in the state, man, woman, and child, any color, they uh, all have half the chance of being a victim of a violent crime. Uh, and uh, That was very, very important. It actually had an impact. But there was one other thing too. As we cut this crime in half, if there was no crime, there was also no criminal. That meant it reduced the number of people that were actually, in fact, going to prison. It gave three clear choices. They could stop doing crime. They could leave California, and a lot of them did. And we uh, have stories on our, our website that literally show the evidence of that, not compiled by us, but by official sources. Uh, and then the third um, uh, option was, yeah, they're going to go down on a third strike if they uh, uh, continue to perpetuate their crime career uh, in California. The last but not least is the 1020 life law, which we followed from three strikes. I'm the author of that as well. Um, the 1020 life law is considered one of the tougher uh, enhancements in the United States. We're not the only state with it, um, but the key to its success is knowing about it. You want people to know about this law before they pull the gun out, not while they're sitting in court trying to figure out how much time I'm gonna do. And in Fresno, we uh, did a, a huge campaign and on it, it when it arrived before it was actually put into place and let people know that this law is going to make a huge difference in, in uh, your uh, punishment. We literally, I don't know if you can see these posters or not, but this is, these bumper stickers went on cars all over the county on police cars, private cars, plus billboards and television advertising saying, Use a gun and you're done. It's a nice light line and rim, uh, rhyme rather nicely to the occasion. What uh, uh, we saw though is, is in uh, uh, the Fresno uh, market, uh, the rest of the state didn't do it. The rest of the, even though it's a state law, no one else ran the commercials. And- um, Mr. Reynolds, I'm gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna cut you off here just because I wanna save time. I do wanna get to the 1020 life gun enhancement, but I wanna let the other folks speak and then we'll, and okay. then we'll come back to it. But thank, right. you, thank you very much for joining us because we want to try to get in short. Got it. I got it. We'll, we'll, we'll give you time because I do want to ask you and we want to talk about it. But I do want to try to keep everybody's opening remarks to, to, to five you. minutes. Um, Mr. Woods. Hello. Um, my name is Erlon Woods and I am the co-producer of the Ear Hustle podcast that I co-created while I was incarcerated at San Quentin in 2015. And our podcast shares the daily realities of life in prison told by those living it, as well as stories from formerly incarcerated individuals. I'm also a project leader of an organization I created also while in prison called Choose One, which is an acronym for Kid Hip Hop Overthrow Oppressive Sentencing Enactments. And at the time, I just wanted to amend the three strike law. But, you know, since being home, I'm now, I'm a founding member of the Repeal California Three Strikes Coalition, which aims to repeal the law, the three strike law in, in 2022. And because to me and my lived experience in prison, it's one of, I think it's the most oppressive law since slavery was valid law. And I say that because when I was 14, I got involved in the drug world, either selling drugs or robbing drug dealers. And uh, at 17, I was arrested for kidnap for ransom of a neighborhood drug dealer. 
um, to settle the case, I took a plea bargain for kidnap robbery in 1989. Um, as a kid, I didn't know the ramifications those charges would have, nor did I uh, understand it to play a vital role in employment when I was released in 1995, uh, which at that time they had the what was that the the box on the on the applications? Have you ever been convicted of a felony? And the word kidnap, in my mind, is what kept me from being employable. And after a year of trying to be employed righteously, sadly, I gave up and went back into the drug world. Um, in December of 1997, I was arrested for attempted second degree robbery and assault with a deadly weapon. Unbeknownst to me because of my plea agreement at 17 years old, I was now facing a life sentence under the new three strikes law. And in 1999, I was convicted and sentenced to 31 years to life plus 26 years to life. Uh, my first chance at a parole was supposed to be in the year 2028. But uh, luckily for me, I was kind of a unicorn. And I sit here today only because two and a half years ago, Governor Brown commuted my life sentence after serving 21 years, and I was immediately released. Um, Governor Brown, he applauded not only the work that I was doing on myself, but also for lifting the veil of secrecy and uh, sharing meaningful stories from those inside of the prison. And throughout my time in prison, I was, I was really taken aback by not just my situation, but by situations of other individuals that was locked up for drug possession, petty theft, joyriding, DUI, gun possession, and seeing dudes get hundreds on top of hundreds of years for nothing serious and it didn't make no sense to me. But what made all the sense to me in my mind was a uh, majority of the people that were sentenced to this oppressive ass law were black and brown people and young black and brown people. This is why I ultimately realized or rather came to the realization that the three strike law should not be amended, it should be repealed because this law was specifically being used for the most part against people of color. Um, and it's the reason why I feel that the three strike law is the most oppressive law since slavery was battle law. And I was there with a lot of people locked up for petty crimes. Uh, it, it, it pretty much severed families for decades. Um, I don't think it solved this issue. It intensified the problem. And I think most of the people that I was there with was trauma impacted, probably like myself. So that's that's it in a nutshell for me. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll just obviously say that I know uh, both you, Mr. Woods, and you, Mr. Reynolds, both of you have spoken in my class, and I really appreciate you joining us today. Uh, Mr. Aaron. Thank you. Um, it's a, a great honor to address uh, you, Chair Romano, and other members of the committee. Um, thank you so much for that. Uh, I just wanted to preface my remarks by saying that my recommendations are kind of following from the Penal Code uh, Section 17.5, where the legislature makes findings, the, our legislature has made findings that increasing sentences or lengthy sentences aren't increasing uh, public safety. Um, and I would note also Professor Seed's, uh, his submission where he noted that it's certainty of apprehension, not severity of punishment, that is the real deterrence. Uh, by way of introduction, I've been a criminal defense attorney for uh, pretty much 33 years. I've been a public defender uh, almost all of my career, at least from 1989. I was a chief deputy in San Bernardino, a directing attorney in the federal public defenders, and now I'm uh, uh, the chief public defender in Mendocino County, and I'm a certified specialist in criminal law. For the last 30 years, I've, I've heard uh, uh, very difficult stories from family members of, of victims like Mr. Reynolds and family members of persons who've really suffered with uh, unbelievably long and harsh sentences like Mr. Woods. I do agree that uh, it's time to abolish or reform the 1020 life law, penal code section 12, uh, 22.53, and the third strikes law. 
I've made a number of suggestions and I have some practical examples that I'd like to share with the committee, but I don't want to take up any more time in my introduction. And again, thank you very much for having me. Uh, thank you very much. And we would like to hear um, some of those suggestions and be able to flesh them out as a group. Uh, Ms. Chan? Yes, thank you for this committee for inviting me here. I'm gonna kind of, I think I'm the, the odd one out. I'm gonna be talking about um, hate crimes uh, instead of the three strikes law, but I really appreciate being on this panel with you, all of you, especially Mr. Erlon Woods. I'm a big fan of your podcast. I've listened to, I think every episode already. Um, so I'm gonna share my PowerPoint here. Um, if it lets me, um, it says it's disabled in terms of allowing me to share my PowerPoint. I don't know if someone can fix it. If not, I, I'll just go ahead. I'll just go ahead. Um, give it a, give it another shot, Ms. Chan. Okay. It should be working now. Sorry about that. Oh, now it works. Yes. Thank you. Um, so uh, hopefully you'll see this. Okay, great. Do you see it? Yes. Okay. Great. Thank you. Um, so I uh, am an attorney at Advancing Justice Asian Law Caucus. We're a nonprofit civil rights organization based in San Francisco. Um, we have uh, a, a affiliation of five organizations, including one in Los Angeles. And what we do at the Asian Law Caucus is that we provide direct legal services, we engage in litigation, and we also move policy at the local, state, and federal level. Another hat I wear is I oversee our policy work. Uh, we're the oldest organization serving low-income Asian immigrants in the country, uh, starting in the 1970s and give you a sense of our programs. Uh, I run our criminal justice reform program. We also have a program that focuses on national security and civil rights, um, the profiling and surveillance of Muslims, uh, South Asians and Arab Americans following 9-11, voting rights, immigrant rights, housing rights, and then workers' rights. I give you a sense of the API population that's impacted um, by uh, hate violence and, and just the API, API population overall. Uh, there are 23 million APIs uh, in the country. 7% um, of the population were the fastest growing group in the country. 30% um, of APIs live in California. Uh, over half of APIs are immigrants, highest proportion of any group. We also make up 14% of the undocumented population in the country. Um, and 12% uh, of APIs live below the federal poverty line. Uh, no that to try to uh, start clarifying uh, the, uh, the model minority myth that often is used uh, against APIs. And this, this moment we're in of um, a rise in anti-API violence, unfortunately, it's not new. Uh, there's a long history of state-sanctioned violence against the API community, uh, including the, the Chinese Exclusion Act back in, in 1882 that really totally excluded uh, most Chinese immigrants from coming to this country. Um, uh, talking about Japanese internment in World War II, uh, Korean and Vietnam Wars, the colonization of Hawaii, right, that um, really harmed uh, Native Hawaiian communities, uh, the targeting of of the Memsa or Arab Muslim South Asian community following 9-11, the Muslim ban under the Trump administration. And then uh, most recently, the last several years, there's been a dramatic spike up in the deportations of Southeast uh, API refugees. And these are uh, people who are getting deported because of old state criminal convictions. Um, and that, that's what's causing individuals in this community to lose their green cards and be subject to deportation, oftentimes back to countries where they were did not even step foot um, because a number of the Southeast Asian refugees came as children to this country and were born in refugee camps uh, during war and following war and genocide. Um, and so that's another issue that we spent a lot of our time working on. Um, in terms of hate violence, wanted to uplift that um, right now, you know, the press coverage and the, the conversations that happen are really focused on interpersonal hate violence, you know, some egregious incidences of uh, interpersonal hate violence, but really it's also linked to systemic violence and institutional state violence, such as deportations, such as Japanese internment, right, such as the Muslim ban. Uh, these are all uh, forms of violence that have impacted the API community. And um, here, next slide, noting that the people who are most vulnerable to interpersonal hate violence are people who are also uh, most impacted by unequal access to housing, education, employment, healthcare, childcare, transportation, immigration status. Um, these are individuals who often live in communities that are under-resourced, meaning there are very few um, community um, services that are language accessible and, and culturally competent. At the same time, they're often over-policed, right? Over-criminalized communities that um, some of the immigrants that are most impacted by violence live in. 
Um, and noting that, you know, we, we talk about hate crimes, but we really want to be more expansive in talking about hate violence, um, because that's, you know, really what's uh, the, the lived experience of API um, community members at this moment. Um, to give you a sense, there are about half of the um, almost 3,800 uh, incidences of reported um, hate violence to this community um, website called Stop AAPI Hate uh, com are coming from California. And the vast majority of these incidences have been reported, 68% are verbal harassment, right? Um, and so they're not, they're not uh, offenses that are incidences that can be charged as crimes, um, since some of them are, or many of them are protected by the First Amendment. And so when it comes to addressing anti-API hate violence, the solution is not hate crimes enhancement or hate crimes charging uh, or putting more resources in the hands of law enforcement. Uh, rather, we really wanna focus on funneling resources to community groups to provide services and interventions to address anti-API hate violence. Um, and this is a, a guide that we put together towards this end. It's called uh, Policy Recommendations for Addressing Anti-API Hate Violence. And um, it's done in collaboration with API community groups throughout the country over the course of many months discussing what we think and what we know are the best uh, ways of addressing hate violence. Um, I'm gonna jump here to just the, this last slide here. Um, Sure, and the, so just to give you a sense of the solutions we're recommending, um, funding rapid response networks to respond to incidences. And these are networks run by community-based organizations trusted by the community to receive these reports and to connect people to services and also to make recommendations to policymakers. Um, bystander training, hopefully many of you have heard about this. We've been giving training after training open to the community. Welcome uh, all of your committee members to also to uh, attend their free trainings about how we can be an ally, um, especially if you're a witness uh, to an incident. Uh, restorative justice programs, which have been found to be much more effective at reducing recidivism. Um, victims funds, right now the California Victims Fund requires reasonable cooperation law enforcement uh, that, you know, in many cases these incidences are not crimes, uh, so that would that, that just doesn't even apply. So we really want to remove some of these barriers. Um, mental health services, making sure their language accessible, culturally competent due to the trauma caused by hate violence. Um, and then community ambassador program, which is active in San Francisco and Oakland. These are um, trusted community members accompanying elders and youth um, vulnerable populations, you know, between different locations. And then right. lastly, ethnic Go studies. Ahead. All right, I'm sorry to cut, cut you off. I, I, um, but I, I do want to get to the Q&A part of our conversation. And, and I really do appreciate the presentation. Um, I want to say, you know, first of all, at the outset, um, can we, there we go. Um, you know, obviously, the scope of our committee is limited to penal code reform. And, you know, we really wanted to have you here uh, Ms. Chan, because um, there have been a lot of complaints that uh, enhancements for hate crimes aren't being, or hate crimes aren't being punished severely enough. Um, and, you know, I, we appreciate your perspective and presentation. Um, I, I'll start the question again. And um, I, I want to turn to Mr. Reynolds. And again, um, it's been a while uh, since we've seen each other. Um, and I hope that you know that. Um, First of all, and, I, and I've told you this directly, but you know, I, what you went through is unimaginable. Obviously, um, as a parent, I can't. I can't imagine. I don't want. I, I don't want to. And I. I believe that you are sincere in your belief, and you're channeling that grief into something that you think better's the state of California. And you and I have had our conversations and disagreements in the past. I just want to clarify uh, one thing. Um, which is just as an empirical matter, you, you believe that the three strikes law and the 1020 life law are justified purely because they reduce crime. And if they didn't reduce crime, you would be okay with changing them, but you are convinced. And of course there's studies all over the place and I don't wanna really debate the numbers right now, uh, but, but that's that's the prince that's the justification for them. It's not, it's not a necessarily about retribution or other re reasons. It's really because you believe that they reduce crime in California. Is that correct? I'm sorry, you're muted. Let's see if I've got that. Okay, am I on yeah. now? Yes, okay. you are. Yeah. Um, uh, it's not just me believing. Uh, the uh, data is, is, is and from uh, your uh, own uh, sources will even tell you that the uh, five years and 10 years after the passage of uh, 
both three strikes and 1020 life, crime dropped in this state at a rate record. I mean, it never dropped that fast in the history of the state. Uh, it, it's remarkable how, how fast it had dropped. There's only one uh, state that had greater drops during that time, and that was New York. And New York uh, City was uh, the, the source of the big drops in crime there. They attributed their drops to a program called the broken window theory. And uh, we all know how that worked. They addressed the little crimes, not the big ones, the little ones. And they said the big ones will take care of themselves. Now here in California, we've kind of played that in reverse by basically uh, little crimes are no longer a crime. <laughs> we've just made crime legal. And, and uh, uh, I think we all realize that uh, uh, the incidents of crimes are going up faster and, and at higher numbers, very similar to the very situation we saw ourselves in back in 1991, 92, 93. And, and what caused that? You know, you're, you're still young enough that you don't remember how we got to those high crime numbers. In the 1970s, that's when uh, we pursued a policy of uh, uh, basically uh, no one was really responsible for their actions. They were just the product of, of the society that had made them, whether it was the use of drugs or uh, their mother didn't love them or whatever it happened to be, uh, that was what caused them to turn into these, the, these criminals. The other misplaced uh, thought was we can rehabilitate anybody given a time of, of, and enough money to do so. And both of those were philosophies that turned out to be flawed. You can't rehabilitate everybody. And people do have to take responsibility for their actions. And, and unfortunately, um, that's what led to um, the, the uh, uh, day that my daughter was murdered. She should not have had to face repeat offenders um, uh, armed with 357 Magnum to be able to uh, kill her outright in the street. That should not have happened. And uh, when crime goes down, fewer crimes means also fewer criminals. Both sides win. There's very few things in life that you can say you get a twofer out of. And this one, you got a twofer out of, whether you're uh, on which side of it you're on. I, I, I agree with you on that last point. I don't agree with you on some of the other points. Um, I, particularly, uh, I think the figures show that crime rates, overall crime rates, property and violent crime rates continue to decrease in our record lows. Um, if you have other evidence, I mean, we've been studying this and we'll be publishing reports on this, but truly, uh, including folks in the audience, this is, this is something that needs to be understood well, that uh, California crime rates remain at record lows right now. Um, and the evidence collection is slow, it's slower than much slower than I would like, but it appears to overall be continuing to be going uh, down. Now, why it's going down and, and where it's going down, those are all you know, separate questions, but I, I really do wanna make sure the record's clear on that. Do other members of the committee have questions? You know, if I had a moment, I'd, I'd like to point out a little something on the race issue. Uh, are we still on? Sure. Okay. Uh, I uh, don't have a way to present this electronically, but- It's okay. Uh, I don't know if you can see this pie chart right here. Yep. This divides uh, uh, basically who is doing the, these uh, crimes, who's the victims of these crimes. This is the uh, 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 nationality of the people that are being prosecuted for homicide. You can see it's almost a third of all of the prosecutions for homicide, 32%. Um, yet uh, black, um, uh, Californians uh, represent about six and a half percent of the total population. And uh, of that, let's say half are male. That's usually the way that works, maybe a little more. So you're looking at a little over 3% of the population are, are black and male. Yet they're literally one third, almost one third of the murder victims, of the murder victims. And it is quite clear that well over 80% of those murders are committed by other black individuals. And that's not, should not be a, 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 any surprise to anybody, but this is the, the uh, uh, 500 pound elephant or whatever you wanna say in the room, somebody needs to be able to bring this out that blacks are killing blacks, not police killing blacks or, or some other you know, uh, uh, sidebar on it. When crime goes down, I want you to see this, this stat as well. When crime goes down, you're looking at the greatest benefactor 
are the black community. When crime goes up, and this shows it both down and up, in the very first portion of our community are the black community. They feel crime going up first, and then they also benefit from the fact that crime is going down first. Um, I had uh, uh, more than one opportunity to be on um, uh, in, in a neighborhood that was uh, a very heavily and dominant uh, with uh, um, our black community. And I couldn't help but notice that the mattresses on the bedrooms, they were set on the floors. And I'm going, why are those, those mattresses on the floors? You can't afford you know, bedsteads. And I happened to also notice that they had bricks against the sides of the, the underneath the windows, you know, so that they could be behind those bricks so bullets would hit the bricks before they got to where they were sleeping. I mean, that's how, how they've had to be in these, these neighborhoods. I had a gentleman say, you know, Mike, I wanna thank you for giving me back my front yard. We would have never been able to go into our front yard here in rememberable history. Okay. And I don't know what your crime stats are showing, but we hear gunfire every night in our neighborhood without fail. And I don't mean one or two shots. I mean, lots of gunfire. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't mean to dis dispute you, but I do want to just say for the record that the attorney general, which compiles statewide crime rates, their most recent report shows that the most recent year on record is the lowest crime rates in California recorded history. I just need to make sure that everybody appreciates that. Professor Ochin. Thank you, uh, Chair Romano. I, I just want to say, um, Mr. Reynolds, of course, I'm, I want to extend my condolences to you regarding your experiences and your loss. But I also want to say that your remarks about uh, the Black community were offensive to me. Um, and I just want to note that. Uh, the statements that you made about uh, Black on Black crime and in relation to police violence were deeply offensive and incorrect. So let me just say that. I also want to ask, are you aware of the LAO study uh, that found of the counties that use three strikes more often in comparison to the counties that use that are least likely to use three strikes uh, have the same amount of decline in crime, roughly 37 or 34 percent in the counties that were more likely to use three strikes, like Los Angeles, Riverside, uh, and in comparison to those counties that were least likely to use three strikes, the decline was roughly 33%. This is a 2005 study from the LAO. And I think that reinforces the point that uh, Chair Romano was making about the disconnect between severe sentences, like, for example, life without parole, which we were just discussing, uh, which also connects to three strikes, and crime rates. Nationally, crime went down including in jurisdictions that did not have sort of habitual or recidivist uh, statutes. So it isn't three strikes that is responsible uh, for crime declines. That happened nationwide and in jurisdictions that had different kinds of policies as to uh, habitual offense, uh, so-called uh, habitual offender statutes. So I just kind of want to uh, centrally state that, that point in terms of correlation not equaling causation. Again, I, I uh, sympathize with you in, in your experience. I hope that you will uh, think about uh, some of the claims that you're making on behalf of the Black community. Uh, black communities are not in favor of expanded uh, policing and punishment like three strikes, LWAP and so forth. Uh, and I live in a community that's heavily policed, South Los Angeles. And you weren't speaking about me or my neighbors. And so I just want to note that. Do I have a chance to respond to that or? Of course, of course, a couple of minutes if you keep it. Yeah, I'll, I'll keep it short and brief. Uh, I've had neighbors for many, many years that, that are black. Matter of fact, they're very close relatives uh, are, are out of Oakland and, and uh, they've commented on it. What you're seeing when you're talking about one county that's enforcing three strikes and one that isn't, that's called selective enforcement. And we're seeing it at a, at a state level and you're seeing it at county levels and, and even city levels. Some laws are, are suddenly uh, thrown out, others are, are um, being used. Uh, and uh, this uniform enforcement uh, uh, is very, very important. It should have one set of laws. We all uh, uh, pass these laws, they're all supposed to be enforced and we, we're not seeing that. The other th uh, thing is, is uh, uh, you should know as far as national stats, 
Uh, 27, 28 other states have, almost 30 states have three strikes laws. Plus there's a federal three strikes of which Joe Biden was the author of uh, the uh, HR 55 law, which was the 1994 crime bill, which had uh, three components, three strikes being one of them. So, uh, and, you know, yeah, you wanna throw three strikes out? Uh, it would be a great experiment. And I fear at the cost of many, many lives. Uh, thank you, Mr. Reynolds. Uh, Mr. Woods, I was wondering if you could uh, talk about, I, I understand that you support not just abolishing the life sentence portion of three strikes, but the second strike component as well. And I was wondering if you feel that um, recidiv there should be recidivist punishment at all, or if other California statutes cover recidivist crimes, or how you would handle people uh, who commit multiple crimes, which seems to be the, the primary concern, obviously, with, with three strikes. All right. So uh, I would say that, you know, you should personalize when you um, sentence individuals. They should be sentenced for the crimes that they commit, you know, not this blanket three strikes law. And I just give you an example. I'm a person that, that was sentenced under the three strike law that never had a doubled up sentence. I've never, I, I went from first base, being that it's a baseball analogy, I went from first base to third base. There was no second base for me, right? So I, I, went in, I went to jail when I was a juvenile. I got out when I was 23. I went back to prison when I was 26. There was no doubled up sentence. There was you going for life for what you did as a juvenile. So I would say that you would definitely have to uh, personalize it for individuals. You know, what the crime you commit, then you get the time for whatever that crime is. But and, and I want to say, Mr. Reynolds, you know, I, I do send my condolences to you for your daughter and no one should ever have to go through that. You know what I'm saying? And but I, I felt and most people that's in prison feel that we receive 25 to life for your daughter and for poly class. That's how we feel, because 25 to life was reserved for people that commit murder. And those were the sentences that we received, you know. So I think that basically, it's, 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 you know, when individuals commit crimes because people are going to commit crimes, they should be dealt with on an individual level and not just some blanket law, not identifying the factors in those people's lives. Okay, in response to you, keep in mind that both judges- Mr. Reynolds, I'm sorry, just to interrupt. I, I wanted, I missed uh, Professor Ochin's hand. Oh, okay, go ahead. Sorry. Uh, so I, one, I just wanna make a factual point to follow up on the previous statement that I made about uh, crime rates and race. Almost all crimes are intra-racial. In other words, white folks victimize white people, black people victimize black people, and so on and so forth because of histories of segregation in this country. Uh, so that's just a basic point. Uh, I, I wanna pivot, however, uh, to Mr. Aaron. Uh, Mr. Aaron, I think you noted that you had some recommendations as to three strikes and as to um, the other enhancements that we're discussing. And I'd like to give you an opportunity to expand on those. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I, I do have a number of them, which I, I wrote out in my submission. And I wanna talk about just a few. Uh, for example, with enhancements and stacking, the 1020 life uh, enhancement for the 10 year enhancement doesn't require that a firearm be loaded or operable. So let's take a one example of an individual who robs a liquor store where there's three people at the counter. He doesn't have a loaded gun. He has an unloaded gun. The gun can't even work. It's inoperable uh, with another individual who robs one person with a loaded gun. The first person would face an uh, aggravated term of five years for robbery, uh, uh, two years for the, the one, one third of the midterm consecutive, seven years altogether, but three separate gun enhancements for 30 years. They would be looking at 37 years. The person who robbed the liquor store with a loaded and operable gun uh, would face five years plus 10 years for the enhancement. So the person who did the unloaded inoperable gun robbery would face 37 years versus 15 years for the other person. That's a difference of 22 years, which is greater, which is almost 50% greater than the sentence that would be faced by the person who had the loaded operable weapon. And that's why I say these enhancements uh, in part because of stacking, in part because of the huge sentences that attach to them are, are kind of unpredictable, unfair, 
uh, and unclear. And I would join with Mr. Reynolds in saying that there is selective enforcement throughout California. Different counties in, enforce things differently. I have a lot of practical experience. I don't have a lot of policy experience, and I don't know all the statistics that, that um, people seem to have at their fingertips, but I have a lot of practical experience dealing with three strikes and the 1020 uh, life enhancement since the very beginning. I've dealt an awful lot with victims and uh, with defendants who are facing those charges. And I can tell you, uh, it's resulted in, in chaos in some of the trial courts in California. It's very difficult to resolve cases. Most of the cases that do go to, to trial are when, you, if you have a young client who's facing a 1020 life enhancement, uh, a lot of times they really just can't grasp it. They, they think it's, well, um, it's 10 or forever. You know, when you're 19 years old, 20 years seems like forever. Um, and I understand all the policy reasons for that, but I'm just talking about the practical effects. There's, I think, like over 15 or 18 gun enhancements that can apply to robbery. It's very difficult to train lawyers to be able to handle this and to advise clients correctly. So that's one of the reasons why I said we need to reduce the number of enhancements. I think also that uh, if you wanted to have an enhancement for firearms that really reflected the, the culpability of the person using it, uh, why not have an enhancement arranged, say, like one to five years? I'm just picking that out of a hat. One to five years. And a more serious use would result in the five years, whereas a lesser serious would be four, three, two, or one year. Uh, in terms of third strikes, I think that Mr. Reynolds is again right that most of the prosecutions do seem to be second strike offenses. Um, that's true. But even there, we've got uh, enormous problems with stacking. And as Mr. Woods pointed out, you can actually get a third strike sentence never having been doubled up. You can get multiple strikes in the same proceeding. And one of the things I think that we should do or that the committee should do is consider changing the definition of what constitutes a strike if they don't abolish the law altogether. And that's because you can have nonviolent uh, actions that, that count as strikes and, and things that um, uh, I gave a couple of examples of residential uh, burglary, burglary of an attached garage. You can have, that's typically juveniles going in and, and stealing a bike or something like that. That counts as a serious felony. You can have people who uh, steal something from a convenience store and then get into a, a, a tussle with the, the security guard and that will count as a robbery. You can have people in a domestic argument who, who, have, uh, um, who say things that they, they really shouldn't and get out of control as people often do in domestic situations and suddenly they have uh, a PC-422 criminal threat strike. And um, you, you would be surprised if you saw how difficult it is to negotiate second strike, even second strike cases, let alone third strike cases, because a lot of district attorney's offices, not uniform throughout the state, but a lot in the state will say, no, you can't strike a strike. So suddenly what would have been a 16-2 or three sentence is six years or four years. And uh, then it's very difficult for clients to understand or accept that. And again, I think I would go back to what Professor Seed said. If there's a certainty of apprehension, that's much more effective than the severity of the punishment. Because the in initial thought on an impulse crime is, well, am I going to get caught? Uh, it's not, am I going to get 10 or 20 years? Or am I going to get double the midterm? It's, am I going to get caught? And if they know that they're going to get caught, whether the sentence is, is two years, six years, or eight years, I think that uh, has a, a, a profound effect on crime. Thank you. Uh, Senator hey. Thank you, uh, Chair Romano. Um, I wanted to return to uh, some of Professor Ocean's comments that uh, the issue of um, Crime occurs most, the, the highest proportion is crime against people we know. And so as her point that due to the clear segregation and uh, in our communities, the, the vast, it is, it is the rare crime that is the white on black crime or black on white crime or API on a Latino crime. Those are the rare crimes, though they often get, and that those stranger crimes, and then are not all stranger, but 
often get the most attention in terms of the media and the press. But the other thing I wanted to talk briefly about is selective enforcement. <clears throat> Certainly, Mr. Reynolds, you can you know, look at the data of which of our counties more commonly uh, applied the three strikes um, in the prosecution. And you can say, well, that's selective enforcement. However, we could also look at, and, it, and there is good data on this, the selective enforcement of who is pulled over, who is then arrested, who is charged, and who is convicted. And now that we are collecting data from communities up and down the state on stops, the, pro, the racial, um, the demographic of, of police stops, and then what, whether those stops result in citations, arrests, convictions, and on, we are starting to see that, and it was already, those communities who are doing it voluntarily, we already knew that black and brown residents of California were disproportionately stopped by police as, as per percentage of their demographic in a community, in, in every community that collected data. And now we're getting that data statewide. But what we have also found is that they have much higher likelihood of then being arrested, charged, and convicted. And so the city of Berkeley, where I live, the auditor just recently did a audit on all of our police department's stock data. And they found, unfortunately, that like so many other communities, our police officers disproportionately stopped Black residents. But what was also uncovered in the audit is that of white stops that were made or stops made of Caucasian drivers, when a search was conducted, there was a higher percent of, of uh, the finding of contraband, which left, led to an arrest on the stops of a Caucasian than on any other of the demographics that were stopped. And yet as a proportion of our population, there were far fewer white stops. So I found that to be very fascinating because you know, our, crime, our stats on who commits crimes might be very, very different if, for example, Caucasian drivers were stopped at the same proportion in terms of our demographic as black and brown drivers. So these things, when we, data is very important for us to track and we need to collect good data, but when our data is only partial, it doesn't help us get a good picture. Thank, thank you. Um, you want some sort of a response on that? Yeah, briefly, please. Yeah. I don't know if it needs a response. Well, it, uh, we, uh, what you said is, is absolutely true, that they do um, um, try to be in, in minority neighborhoods at a greater uh, uh, rate than they are in some of the other portions of the cities. However, uh, what they are trying to do is reduce crime. And if you want to reduce crime, you put your law enforcement where the crime is. And, and if, they, uh, if they have a higher rate of crime in those neighborhoods, their greatest concern is uh, getting somebody there in a timely fashion. Response time is, is one of the big critical uh, factors, as well as patrolling and see if there's um, uh, people that look like they're ready to do crime and see what you can do to get them off the streets. So that's called uh, a, 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 a department that's trying to lower your crime rates. Otherwise, you have what's called a reactive, a reactive department, and we have them throughout the United States. Chicago is a classic example, and I might add Chicago also, or Illinois, has a 1020 life law. They don't advertise it, no one knows about it, and no one uses it. Um, the uh, fact is, though, uh, when uh, uh, a murder occurs in Chicago, once the uh, chalk lines are on the ground, then the cops will show up. I mean, it's a little bit uh, too little, too late. They're not okay. they're I, 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 I want to just keep us fo focus a little bit, just because Chicago is a little bit far afield from our jurisdiction. It is, but, but that's what you're going to end up with. No, I, I, practicing it. I, I hear that, and you know, you and I have also discussed about experiments with reforms to the three strikes law and. 
you know, predicted all sorts of uh, parade of horribles that would res result of Proposition 36. And of course they didn't come to pass. Uh, the crime rates have gone down, but I want to switch to Ms. Chan because I think that yeah, she- Can I just interject here? Of uh, course, I didn't see your hand. Yes. I find it interesting that Chicago is always raised when we're talking about uh, criminal law, crime, violent crime, particularly by people like our former president. And I find it's often used as a dog whistle uh, for racism. Uh, and so I just want to call that out because it's a largely black city Right, people look to, you know, they say Chicago and what they mean is black people. I just want to note that. I'm not, I'm not suggesting that was your intention, Mr. Reynolds, but I just want to call it out as a dynamic. I also want to note that uh, there are studies about what police actually do. Uh, and you can look to the New York Times. They actually did a report last year uh, and they looked at a number of large police departments, Mr. Reynolds, and they found that police departments um, that they studied. Uh, looking at a number of calls, and they found that police responded to serious or violent crimes only about, in terms of how police officers spend their time, it's only about 9% of what they do, right? So most of the time it's officer initiated calls where they actually are going out and looking for people who they find to be suspicious. And so the way in which we're policing is actually generating crime statistics, not actual crime statistics, because if police went to Beverly Hills, uh, or LMU where I teach looking for crime, they would find it because people use drugs, people do all kinds of things, right? So you find, you, you, you find, you, you, you find crime where you look for it. And so because policing is so deeply racialized, we find crime in racialized communities. And police, again, don't spend their time, most of it, looking at and responding to violent crime. They spend it looking at low level offenses that generate more policing, that generate more crime and generate more racial disparities. So again, I just wanna correct the record, particularly for our viewers, or the folks who are joining us um, uh, and, and are watching these proceedings. Thank you. Um, I have a question for Ms. Chan and then I have a question for Mr. Aaron. I'm gonna ask them both at the same time. Uh, Ms. Chan, I found it interesting that despite especially the high profile um, apparent spike in hate crimes, especially against API community in California, that you and your organization uh, do not believe that increased punishment is a way to address that. I just wanted to make sure that that was clear. And I hate to ask you to speak for an entire community, but do you can you talk about that a little bit more? Because it's obviously something that you care a great deal about, but none of your recommendations were to increase the punishment for uh, hate crimes. That's right. Um... So two things, one is, as I pointed out, the vast majority of incidences that have been reported uh, to the Stop API hate line, which is, seems to be receiving more reports than law enforcement. Um, it's more, it seems like it's more trusted by community members to report what's happening. Um, the vast majority, 68% are verbal harassment, right? Um, so they're not, they're in many circumstances, not crimes that can be prosecuted because they're protected by the First Amendment. And so that's why the solutions should reflect that, right? The solutions should be focused on how do we uh, intercede? How do we protect the individual when they're being victimized through so things such as bystander training, right? How do we reduce recidivism through things such as restorative justice? Um, and so, and how do we prevent it through uh, education, ethnic studies? And so I really wanna match the solutions with what's actually happening on the ground. Uh, when it comes to these high profile incidences that, you know, local news um, covers frequently and replays on repeat. I think what's important is to look beyond the uh, initial, you know, shock of how horrible these incidents are because they're absolutely horrible. None of us want our elders harmed. You know, let's make that crystal clear. Um, but I think the, the situation is we want, we want to prevent this from happening again. And if we want to prevent this from happening again, we need to look deeper at who, you know, what happened here? Who is the individual who would randomly walk up to an 80 year old and stab them? Like, what, you know, what is going on here? And if we were to look you know, deeper at these issues, you know, like really read these reports of what's happening, um, talk with the DA's office, talk with the PD's office, you'll find that in many of these situations, the individual has had a, a serious history of mental health crisis. Um, in some ca cases, uh, addiction also. Um, and, and when they had, and if you look at their history, when they've had intense, you know, when they have intense wraparound mental health services, they, the incidences of violence tend to decrease. 
Um, but if they're you know, going in and out of jail without connection to any services, that's when that, uh, the rate of violent incidences by some of these individuals does not decrease. In fact, it can you know, increase. Um, and so that, that, that's kind of what we're looking at is we wanna make sure that no other members of our community are harmed. And if we focus just on police and look on jails and prosecution, we're not going to prevent that. Um, and so that, that's, you know, we know, we know this from decades of doing this work, right? Not just what's happening right now. Thank you. Um, Mr. Aaron, I have um, two questions for you. Um, first is um, if we were to, if California was to repeal the three strikes law, including the second strike law, can you describe the uh, recidivist enhancements that remain on the books that would apply to folks um, or would not apply? And uh, likewise, with if repealing the 1020 life law, we don't have, I mean, California does not have a statute for armed robbery, right? We have, you could get an aggravated term for robbery up to five years, but um, you, need a, you would need a gun enhancement, right? In order to make armed robbery a, a more severe punishment than non-armed, unarmed robbery. So I was wondering if you could just briefly address the, committee and educate us a little bit on the exi existing penal code of um, alternative enhancements, let's say, um, in re the recidivist context and in the gun context, if those two laws were off the books. Sure, in terms of, of prior offenses, if you have three felonies, you're not eligible for probation. If you have a prior serious felony and you commit a new one, you have a five-year enhancement um, so there are a, a number of things which do impact uh, recidivists already. And in fact, you can get the five-year felony enhancement in addition to the uh, uh, strike punishment. And that's another instance of, of stacking, which I didn't include in my example. Right. I don't want, I don't I want to get into it. I want to try to avoid the three strikes. I want to try to avoid the three strikes law, and I get it. Is the, is the nickel prior, the five-year prior, the most, the, the longest enhancement you can get for uh, prior crimes absent the three strikes law? Is yes, I think so. Uh, there are uh, a, a number of gun enhancements and before uh, 12022.53, there was 12022.5, which was originally 345 and then it was changed. And um, I forget exactly now when it was changed, but it was changed to 3410. So there are other gun enhancements that could be used. And what I was said, one of the things that I recommended is rather than having a three, four, five, for example, you could have a gun enhancement of one to five to reflect, as Mr. Woods was saying, the individual culpability of the person who was using the gun. Were they just armed with a gun? Uh, did, they, did they brandish the gun? Did they fire the gun? That sort of thing. Um, and, and I think that there's plenty of other crimes which would fire uh, someone who, which would apply to someone who fires a gun and actually injures somebody. I'm curious, uh, in terms, if you were to eliminate, I, I know that you can stack uh, a five year prior nickel and a second strike sentence. So it counts, your prior counts multiple times in a way. Um, but if we were to eliminate the, the second strike law, and just had the five year prior, might that be longer in many cases than a doubled up sentence as a second strike sentence? No, because they can still get the five year prior now. If you have a prior residential burglary and you commit another residential burglary, it's two, four, six times two plus five. If so, that would be 17 years. If you have just a residential burglary with a five year prior, it's two, four, six plus five. So that's seven to 11 years. Right, I was saying if we took out the second strike law altogether. So if you took out the right. second- Right, right. Okay, I, 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 I think I understand. Uh, I, I, I was told when I went to law school, there would be no math, but I think I, I, think I understand it. Uh, keep yeah. in mind, they have to serve 80% under uh, of their strikes. Yes, well, I think that that's been amended by Proposition 57. Um, so I'm not sure that that's exactly accurate, but we have Was Secretary- Was that down to 60% uh, uh, or 66% or what? 
we, we have Secretary Allison who's joining us next, and uh, there are new regulations out on that re related to Prop 57 that she can address if the committee has questions about that. Um, we just have a few more minutes if anybody has any further questions. Okay, um, I, I wanna wrap it up. As I said uh, earlier, I've known um, some of you um, for, for quite a while, and I do appreciate um, your time and input here. And, um, you know, these, these are heated and um, topics, criminal law in general. And um, I think one of the reasons that we have this committee is to try to have conversations across the spectrum uh, as much as possible to uh, hear each other out and not rely on sound bites and uh, television commercials and uh, um, individual episodes that might be outsized from their impact on crime. I think that, I hope that we all share the um, general goal that we want to um, make California as safe as possible. The question is, you know, how do we do it? I'm sorry, um, before we go, uh, Assembly Member Lee, I didn't see their hand raised. So I'll give you the last uh, question and then we'll take a break after uh, you hear the answer. Assembly Member Lee. Sounds good. Well, thank you. Uh, really thank you to all the presenters who presented, especially to Angela, who talked about the really excellent intersection of API hate crimes and why we cannot double down on jailing uh, as the solution to everything. Um, Mr. Aaron, I did want to just kind of elaborate on some of the some of the things you talked about, because you said that um, the severity of the crime very, very often doesn't really deter crime or severity of the sentence, I should say, um, the the certainty of of of, of accountability is more important. So, and as we kind of just demonstrated in our back and forth with our chair is that, you know, even to the experts, the certainty of the, the certainty of, or sorry, the severity of the sentence can often be confusing. Even we are not exactly sure what often the years are and how they mix again these formulas. So what do you think about like, or are there any ideas about proposals about limiting the stacking of enhancements? Because often that the thing that confuses a lot of people, whether they're the defense lawyers, the alleged in general or the anyone in the court is how all these different enhancements have created since the decade since I was born uh, have just been stacked on together and kind of is a very confusing and non-linear system. So even from the argument of severity, it's quite uncertain. So I just wanted to get your thoughts on perhaps what a proposal looking like on limiting stacking could be like. Um, well, you could do a, a number of things. You, there were limitations of uh, double the base term, or you could, uh, that used to uh, um, exist, or you could do uh, limitations of the terms imposed. For example, if you had 16, 2, and 3, you could limit enhancements to uh, 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 16 months. If you had a three year sentence, you could limit it to three years. If you had a rape, for example, 3, 6, 8, you could limit it to 3, 6, or 8 years. Uh, you could fix an arbitrary amount that there would be no enhancement greater than, than 10 years uh, if you wanted to. There's many, many ways that you could limit it. But the, the truth is, is that there's got to be something done. And, and I think that it was District Attorney, um, uh, District Attorney Rosen who pointed out that we really have to uh, revise the law regarding enhancements that it's become un unmanageable. And basically we have a situation now where the, the tail is wagging the dog, that in many cases, the enhancement is more uh, 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 lengthy and severe than, than the actual punishment. That's right. Thank you, Sarah. Could, could I add maybe a, a little something here? Uh, I, sure. Okay. Uh, what would do more than this debate uh, than any other possible thing on, on the table here. It's, it's, it's simple, it's cheap, and it would be very, very effective. And that is explain in our schools. And I mean, teenagers, uh, high school or junior high, uh, exactly on, on both three strikes and 1020 life were specifically designed to be very simple and easy to understand. I'm not a very bright guy. So I think that my, my mentality would be that of probably the repeat offender. So that having been said, tell people what they could face if they have these kinds of offenses. It has to be complicated in, uh, as, as an attorney, uh, our, uh, as uh, Jeffrey Aaron explained, make it simple. Hey, three strikes, this is what it means. 
10, 20 life. You use a gun and you're done. You know, these can be brought down to the, the simplest minds and they have to understand that as, as as juveniles because that's hey there's no big secret here juvenile offenders go on to become adult offenders and a low level offenders go on to become high level offenders that's that's what you're faced with here so the only chance you have addressing this problem is at the earliest point of entry and and that's as juvenile offenders and that's why they're still in school and that's why the simple easy to understand laws if you get this in front of them class-wise, you don't have any incarceration, any victims, any uh, uh, of, of the proceedings that uh, are both costly in terms of law enforcement and, and uh, defense and on and so forth. There you go. Well, let me just say, I'll, we'll close uh, with, with that, with the agreement that the California Penal Code is extraordinarily complicated and that the idea that these laws that this, this thick book, would, nobody uses the book anymore, but anyway, because we need a computer to read it, um, you know, acts as a deterrent, I think is, you know, is ridiculous. And one of the things that, you know, is, you know, the legislative directive for this committee is to simplify the penal code in, in order to, in some ways, accomplish some of the things that you were just saying, Mr. Reynolds, because um, I don't think that, you know, people walking into court judge from prosecutors, to defense lawyers, to judges, to the defendants, to the victims, have a really clear understanding of the way that all the different laws, and we're just talking about the most clear and simplest laws, even those get very complicated. So, um, you know, one of our missions is really to, to simplify them and um, not just to, for simplicity's sake, but we hope to, you know, improve the administration of justice and reduce crime ultimately is, you know, what we're after. So with that, um, I'm going to adjourn this panel. We'll have our third panel. We're gonna take a little bit of a longer break this time. We're gonna reconvene at 4 p.m. Um, and uh, I wanna thank you all again for coming. I've known some of you for a long time. I really appreciate the extra effort that you made to join us today. We uh, look forward to hearing from you. Do not be uh, strangers and please um, continue to um, be in touch with the committee and we'll be in touch with you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.